And so um, I wanted to tell you that there's, you know, the little stickers we have, Think Positive and the little stones, they originated right around the corner here in Berkeley. When I, before I, when I was starting the center 10 years ago or more, I guess 11 years ago, I was in town by myself, this little Aspie running around in a rental car and with a cell phone and, and trying to figure out how to start a center here. And I was frustrated because I was over, you know, trying to do it all myself, I was usual. And, um, and that was only a couple years after I diagnosed, so I still didn't have a lot of teamwork ability. And so um, I went around the corner and I'm saying to myself, Michael, you need to think positive. And I'm getting like, and I look over on the, the Berkeley's a strange place, you know that. I look over on a store windowsill and there's a, rock, a stone that says think positive on it. So I picked it up and it became my sensory uh, device. I put it in my pocket, it calmed me down. And I said, this is great. So I started making them. And this is like 12 years ago. People have stones all over the world. And the effect of the stones is really strange. It's like they've had all these, they say, well, my, you know, my friend had cancer and I gave her one and put it on in front of her sink in her kitchen. It helped her so much. So I get these stories back. And when people never get rid of the stones, now you get the stickers, which my son, who's a millennial, made, right? But they never get rid of the stones, and they uh, keep them, and they say to me, I still have your stone, I still have your stone. So I still do it, and I still have some stones in my bag if someone really, really wants one. Otherwise, you get a sticker. Okay, so I'm going to start off here and say that um, the, uh, the little handout that you have, hopefully you have it. No, you don't have it. So they didn't give it out? Oh, they did give it out. Okay. That's my little notes, and that's taken from Mark Twain, who used to do these little cards with pictures on them to remember his speeches. And it's also my friend Oliver uh, West in London does uh, uses this as a note-taking system for kids with on the spectrum. If I had had this system, these blank forms for college, I would have gotten straight A's on everything. But my notes, I couldn't even read. And when I would go back to study for a test, I'd say, just give up, because I didn't read the textbooks. So I had to look at the notes, and I couldn't decipher them. They didn't make any sense. But if I had done it in pictures, I would have been right on it. So we're gonna, you're going to have to guess what these are. I'm not going to tell you. And I put, in, I put some letters on there to make it a little easier for you. Without the letters, it might be a little tougher. So um, we said, I decided to do a little preview of the book Employ, which is coming out in the fall. It's a, note, a workbook for transitions for job skills for kids on, on high school and college to, to uh, transition to employment. And it's being printed by Jessica Kingsley Publishers in London. And it's really succinct. You can, it's self-paced. You can give it to the student and work with them. And they can just do the exercises. The little stories are in there and, and all the main points. So I just took a couple areas out of the book. And that's what you have here. So what does the 8 um, S4W, no staff can answer this question. What does that stand for? Anyone think, think about it? 8 what? Skills, I'll give you that part. 4, work. So those are the things that they're going to follow. What's number 1? Communication. Communication. And that is number 1, right? Because then the rest of it doesn't work. The relationships, talking to your boss, nothing works without number one. And that's why we have social skills training at our programs. That's why it's so important for them to be able to advocate and talk about things. Why do you lose your job, right? You can't advocate for yourself. You can't speak up. So it's really number one. What's number two? Teamwork. Teamwork. No man is an island. Collaboration is the big word now in businesses, right? You have to work in teams. We got that from the Japanese, right, about 20 years ago when they had them in, in their car plants where they have teams work for quality control. Teamwork is a necessity, and they have to do it. You, don't, you can't just phase out and, and, uh, and work on your own. Now, you can in, like, Silicon Valley. They'll put you in an office, and you can work all night if you want and sleep the next day and if you have a good project. But... Most of those projects, too, are team-based, right? You're doing maybe the software. Someone else is doing the whatever. So you have to learn it. Number three, what is it? Nope. 
No, it's not planning. It's a harder one. Problem solving and critical thinking. And uh, cr what we're really good at as Aspies is creative thinking, right? If I, I, th I say to people, there should be an Aspie on every committee, every company should have one in their board of directors because they're gonna give you a unique perspective on the problem, right? They think out of the box. That's one of our assets. So you want an Aspie, we want diversity, whether, no matter what that person who's in charge of our country now says, we want diversity. I don't say that name. And <laughs> it's part of my personal problem. But <laughs> what's the next one? I'm gonna get off base. Leadership and initiative, right? So there's a little story here, it's in the book, the new book. Oh, I didn't turn on the timer, so that's gonna screw us up, but we'll just pretend I'll try to go quicker. Um, let's see, initiative. So there's a story about a kid working at a recycling plant, and he notices that they have the bins that collect the different things outside, and it rains, and they fill with water, and they have, that's a problem for them. So he made a suggestion, a suggestion to the boss. We have this roof that sticks over out here, why don't we put them under there so we don't have to constantly deal with the water? It's just a small suggestion. He just thought out of the box, and that really helps him on the job, right? That's just creative thinking. Give a nice suggestion, say, why don't we put them over here underneath the, 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 uh, the ceiling? So, you know, just re, re, rearrange the bins outside, how, we, how we're doing it. So that's something that's common sense, but some, sometimes a unique person can, can come up with things like that. So that's initiative, and that's what you have to show on a job. You can't sit back and wait for your boss to tell you the next thing to do. And what we've done with students with that one, too, is we say a good job coach will go to the boss and say, now if Shirley runs out of things to do in the pharmacy, where's a list of five things she can do? And, and so she can go to like sweeping the floor, arranging the merchandise and stuff, so that Shirley's not sitting around saying, well, I don't have anything to do on their cell phone, right? So that, and then he gets tired of managing Shirley and lets her go. So you, you gotta stay on that, and that's something that students have to learn. Uh, Self-management, oh, I'm sorry, I gave it to you. <laughs> that's what that stands for. And um, that means that is taking care of your own problems and not bringing them into work, right? So that you have to manage, right? If you're having a problem, like I have a stomach ache right now, I ate something I shouldn't have eaten this morning. So I self-managed by having a big cup of green tea about an hour ago, which you know what that does. And so I think I feel so much better. It's all moved down through my system. Thank you. And so that's self-management. I had to say, okay, well, how am I gonna get to this, do this speech now when I feel like I'm gonna any minute? So. And I'm not nervous at all, you can tell that. But So uh, that's part of your self-management skills, is how do you handle your hungry, angry, lonely, tired, your, you know, and how do you handle that? Like we use that acronym with our student, HALT. So if you woke up this morning and um, you, know, you have a, an issue with your spouse, when you go to work, you, know, you gotta handle work, you still have to handle your employees nicely, right? And so if you're lonely, or you're tired, like you didn't sleep last night. I know Michael didn't sleep last night and he did really well anyway, right? And so, um, you know, you have to be able to deal with these things as an adult. And we have, to, the students like are oblivious to it sometimes. They don't know how to self-manage these things. So we have to teach them how to do that. And we have a daily process called reframing where they do these emotional thermometers and they rate themselves and things like that. So it truly really work, works really well. Willing, oops, what's the next one? I'm telling them all the answers. Willingness to, to what? To learn, right? So, it's also willingness to make mistakes. And this is where our students have a problem. They get perfectionistic, right? Like, I don't want to make a mistake, so I'll never ask anyone out on a date again, because she might say no. And it happened five years ago, so I'm not gonna do it again, 
right? This is what happens all the time. This perfectionistic thing keeps us from trying new things because we want to do it perfectly the first time. We don't want to make mistakes. But just think of the light bulb, right? What did Edison have to go through? 999 trials of different metals to before tungsten worked, right? So were those mistakes or were they approximations to the right answer? Glass half full, half glass half empty. So we got to teach our students to accept mistakes and to keep trying and not worry about it. it doesn't who cares if you look like an idiot a little bit? I do it all the time, so and I'm in charge. So I guess you can get away with it. So uh, let's see, and to tolerate ambiguity. You know, things don't always turn out exactly the way you want, and sometimes you have to. You know, we need compromise, negotiation. These are things that Congress needs to understand, right? And, and we work out problems together. There's got to be common ground that we can do on an energy bill or on whatever. There's common ground that we all agree on. Let's at least pass that, right? Let's do that together. So what's the next one? Technological skills. But that's more than what our students think, right? That's not Facebook. That's not a technological skill. It's the real skills, the hard transferable skills of being able to use, you know, all the different, um, you know, things, software on your computer, you know, like Excel and stuff like that. Those are real skills that can actually translate into jobs. So you have to have the real skills. Now, the next one's going to be the hardest one. It's sort of goofy. And just, it's three words. The top is, well, really one word, but it's two parts of it. And then it's something of something. And it's going to be very hard to get. I don't think anyone's going to get it, but try. Yeah, you can't get it because you did it yesterday. What's the second little picture? It's a nest, right? So that tells you one part of the word. And what's the, what's the first figure? It's an angel. So what's an, is an angel? How are is an angel? What are they? Are they good or bad? So good, nest. Goodness of fit, right? Who said fit? Hey, as you go, that's great. Because pants don't fit on the guy, so it's fit. So it's a little bit stupid, but you got it. So goodness of fit is part of our book. And what we're talking about there is students get to pick the fitness, what, what kind of fit they want for themselves on a job. And they're unique individuals, so they're not going to just fit anywhere. You can't put them, you know, this, this room I could work in. It has some natural light, has offset lighting. I could probably work here. If you had a desk here, I'd probably be able to tolerate working here. But other places, in cubicles, up in a factory or something, it's not going to happen. So um, what's the first kind of fit that the student needs to look at? E. It's not environment. No, it's close. It's employer fit. So do you, have you ever worked for different employers? Is there some that used to drive you crazy? Like they're very neurotic or whatever on you all the time? And someone else who like just sort of monitors you once in a while? It's quite a difference, right? So you have to pick the right kind of person you want to work with. And you don't always have a choice because you could lose your supervisor. But in general, we, you want to be with kind of people that you like. So one example would be a student working at a health food store where there's all the crunch, the crunchers are there, the granola crunchers. You know, you know, there's whole California you don't even get that joke because California is granola crunch. It's the whole the whole state is the granola crunchers. But elsewhere we get that. So uh, no, like you know, that kind of environment is very welcoming. It's very laid back. You know, yeah, how are you, man? You know, and these kids can get do well there. In, in that kind of environment, but they might not do well at a supermarket where you have Mr. Neurotic running it or something, you know? So you have to, they, they, they sort of have to tell you those by their signals. What's the next one? Someone said environment, right? So what's the environment is working in a city, like here, if you're an accountant, do you want to work in an environment in a big, tall building in the middle of the city where you have to take buses in every day for a half hour and, um, or you have to take the BART and it's really crowded in the morning. Um, 
and you're on the third floor and there's 20 cubicles in the space? Or do you want to work in the back of a little house in Oakland where the guy has you know, a business and he gives you your own room and you can bring your bicycle and you can relax and do your work and, and you do really well? So those are choices, right? So you get to choose that. The next one, that's the easiest one. Everyone should say together. Sensory. That's, that's obviously if you don't like loud sound and you're not going to work at a business that's right next to a fire department, you know, or whatever. So you have to take these into account because our sensory issues, like for example, I was telling Michael today, I think, or yesterday that when I go to airports, oops, that's not going to work, but I'll try to. <laughs> when we go to the airport, I can't stand it. They just, they're announcing these things in one gate, and they're announcing the other one at the same time. Someone, some guy, there's always a guy with a, one of those land, you know, talking on his cell phone, but he has a little mic here, and like his business is something you really want to know about, and he's going to say all this crap that you don't want to hear. And so then there's a baby crying, and and there's these carts that go by, me, 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 makes me crazy. I have to go in the meditation room of the chapel, at and I meditate or do yoga or something. And until about 10 minutes before my flight, and I zip out and go, because it's just crazy. So what's the next one? Social. And what's that picture of? Social fit. It's a, it's a water cooler, believe it or not. So we call it the behavior at the water cooler. That's how you know that you're actually being social at work. If you go to the water cooler and, and the person on the other side says, Hey, how did you watch the Raiders this weekend or whatever? And you say, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you also meet your wife or your girlfriend at the water cooler. Places like the water cooler. You don't meet them on, well, you meet them online too if you want. But <laughs> that's, well, it's probably more common nowadays. But uh, so the behavior at the water cooler is being able to socialize. And here's the story I gave the other day was everyone packed, everyone said, hey, it's Cindy's birthday today. We're going to go out to lunch. You want to come with us? And you packed your lunch. The Aspie guy packed the lunch. And he's thinking, I'm going to eat that lunch. It's in, the it's in the refrigerator in the staff lounge. And he cannot have the cognitive flexibility to leave that lunch there till the next day. And what does that do? He's the first one to be fired because no one knows him. He doesn't get the promotion because no one knows him. And he never has any fun or builds any social fabric for himself. So you have to be flexible enough to do that and put, leave the damn lunch there and go with them. And that's something I've only learned in the last 10 years. So what's that I? It's a nuclear power plant, but... No, it's close. Intellectual fit. We were just talking about that this afternoon, how smart these kids are, and then they end up being a bagger. And it's such a waste of, it says, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. Like, you know, remember they had that for black colleges? It's so true. These kids are way underemployed in things that they, they should. And a lot of companies are realizing that. There's a lot of groups that are training them and getting specialized staff to help them. OK, one minute, and we're going to be done. What's the last one? Emotional fit. So um, stress is a big factor on a job. So you have to be where you feel comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable in a business, you shouldn't take that job. And, this, and the job coach should say, is this a match for you? Do you feel comfortable here? I mean, yeah, you can't have the whole world live around you, but you sure can eliminate five of these maybe so you don't have a chance on the job, right? So uh, stress, your emotional well-being on a job. How do you feel about this place? Do you think you can work with these people? Do you think you, you like the environment? Do you, so these are important factors when you're looking for a job. And this is just little, two little areas of the new book. It goes into everything, and it's very concise, and you follow through. So I'm going to pass it on, and thanks for listening.